Good morning and welcome to prayer and fasting class. We're going to go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for loving us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving me this opportunity to teach. And Lord, it's been a blessing uh, teaching these classes, Lord. I've uh, personally uh, been able to grow closer to you through it, Lord, and I pray that we continue to do that. I pray that we all continue to draw closer to you uh, through this prayer and fasting, Lord. And, uh, now that we have more time uh, uh, through this quarantine to spend with you, Lord, may we all use that time wisely. And Lord, I just ask for your blessings upon this class today and uh, that you just be lifted up. We ask all this of your honor and your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to begin a new uh, topic in our prayer and fasting class. Our last, our last half of the semester we covered fasting. And uh, we basically went through Isaiah chapter number 58 and just did a verse by verse uh, uh, examination of, of that chapter. And uh, out of the whole Bible, when it comes to the topic of fasting, uh, that chapter gives us the most information on it. And uh, hopefully it was profitable to you. And now we're going to talk about prayer and uh, all that it entails with prayer and uh what the Bible has a lot to say about prayer, so obviously we can't fit it all in this last half of the semester, but we'll try to cover a lot of ground and uh, hit the, the most important uh, uh, parts of it. And uh, we're going to start this morning in the book of Mark, chapter number 1, uh, verse number 35 through 38. Mark, chapter number 1, verse number 35 through 38, if you want to follow along, you can to turn there. <coughs> Mark, chapter number 1. Verse number 35 through 38. The Bible says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found them, him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. That's Mark chapter 1, verse 35 through 38. You know, there's some things about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, that have to do with who he was. Uh, there's a lot of things about the Lord, uh, his uh, attributes that he has. As a matter of fact, next, next semester we're going to be looking at the attributes of God. Some of his attributes um, we can just admire from afar off. Uh, he's omniscient. Uh, he's uh, omnipresent. He's all-knowing. He, he's in every place at the same time. He's all-powerful. Uh, those are just things that we cannot partake of. We cannot do those things, but we can just admire from afar off and thank him that he has those attributes and that he is the God of gods and the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and, and thank God he's our God. But there are some of his attributes that he wants us to have. I mean, he says, be holy, for I am holy. So that must be something that we can do in our life is be holy. And as you examine the life of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and the things that he did, he did, for example, for us to follow. We're supposed to, in the book of 1 Peter, he tells us to follow in his steps. And uh, we can look at his life and see what he did and things he practiced and his character. And we can try to emulate that in our lives. <clears throat> you know, I can never duplicate his perfection. I can never duplicate his power. I can never duplicate his omnipresence. <clears throat> but I can duplicate his consistency. I can duplicate his discipline and some things that he did. <clears throat> I can duplicate some of his practices because discipline is not a miracle. <clears throat> and that's what I want to talk about uh, in this uh, lecture today is the discipline of prayer. Prayer is a discipline. It's a di discipline. The Christian life is a discipline. You know, I'd say it this way. <clears throat> when it comes to our, our how we should act towards other Christians, we should be graceful to them. We should treat them like the Lord Jesus Christ treated us <clears throat> and, and have grace and mercy. Uh, towards everybody that we come encounter with. <clears throat> and when it comes to us, uh, we should be disciplined. A lot of times we have Christians 
have it the other way around, and we're hard on everybody else. But when it comes to us, we want everybody to be gracious and merciful to us. But the way it should be is that we should have grace and mercy. We should work with people. We should be patient with people. We should be long-suffering with people. But when it comes to our own personal walk and devotion to the Lord, we should lead a disciplined life. And we should be hard on ourselves, easy on everybody else. Discipline is a matter of bringing my body into subjection. I've got to tell Kevin what to do. <clears throat> you know, a lot of times uh, uh, I'll be preaching and I'll notice in the teen section, uh, one teen will get up and they'll go to the bathroom and they'll come back in. It always happens during the preaching time. They don't, they don't go to the bathroom during the singing time. But when the preaching time happens, you'll see them. They'll get up and go to the bathroom. They'll come back in. Then they have to go to the bathroom again. They come back in. And this time they take one of their friends to the bathroom with them. And they're totally letting their flesh operate their body. And a lot of times in the Christian life, uh, you, you see that. We let our flesh dictate our, and, and, and we submit to our flesh. When our flesh is hungry, we obey it. When our flesh uh, wants to do this and wants to be entertained, we obey it. When our flesh is tired and wants to sleep, we obey it. <clears throat> but God wants us to be disciplined. He wants us to not be led by our flesh, but to be led by the Spirit and to be led by the Word of God. That takes discipline. I've got to, when I wake up in the morning, my pastor used to say, uh, when he wakes up in the morning, and if you hit the snooze uh, button on your alarm clock, you just let the flesh win the battle that day. <clears throat> we need to be disciplined. We need to, I have to make myself get up every morning, have devotions. I've got to take my family to church every Sunday. That requires discipline. <clears throat> I've got to tell my body what to do. I cannot let my body dictate what I want to do or what it wants to do. Most of us allow our bodies to tell us what they're going to do, and we respond. Discipline is when I set the going to do, and we respond. <clears throat> Discipline is when I set the boundaries uh, according to God's Word and according to the principles of His Word and tell my body, this is what we're going to do, and then follow through with it. <clears throat> that is putting my body under subjection. That is discipline. The prayer life of the Lord Jesus Christ illustrates discipline. In our text, the Bible says that Jesus had the discipline of a set time to commune with His Heavenly Father every morning. It says, in the morning, rising up a great while before day, you see, He had sanctified uh, or a solitary place to pray. Uh, this is what He did every day. He went out into a solitary place and there prayed. Jesus had some set places where he went forth to pray. He had some places set apart for the work of intercession. There are two things that you'll notice about the Lord Jesus Christ and the place of his prayer. Number one, it was always a solitary place where he could get away from the hustle and bustle and cares of life. And number two, it was always a specific place where he had frequently gone. Listen, the disciples knew where to find him. That tells us something. Went to God, you and I were consistent enough about our Christianity that people would know where to find us at set times. Jesus had a steady habit. In verses 36 and 37, the fact that his disciples knew where to find him gives proof of his habitual practices of going to set places to pray. He did this all the time. This was not a passing fancy. This wasn't something that he just did on a whim and was sporadic uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. This was a daily activity. <clears throat> if it was that important for the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to have a discipline of a set time, <clears throat> a solitary place, and a steady habit, how much more important it is for us, being frail beings like you and me, to exercise <clears throat> the discipline of prayer. We should have a habit of prayer. We should have a, a set place of prayer, a set time of prayer. And we should discipline ourselves to follow through on that plan that we have, that schedule that we have, that place that we go to every single day. For people to be consistent in the matter of prayer is not natural. There are several things in a Christian life that take discipline. You know, it's funny that it seems the hardest thing in the, I mean, the Christian walk is so easy. 
I mean, you just got to pray and read your Bible, get in fellowship with God. Yet that seems to be the hardest thing in the world to do. <laughs> and God makes it so easy, but it's so hard for us to do it sometimes. <clears throat> the reason why is because those things do not come naturally. <clears throat> if you and I do not exercise discipline, we will not pray. And most folks don't have a prayer life. Soul winning is a discipline. You will not go soul winning if you not not schedule soul winning and make a plan to go and make yourself do what you're supposed to do on the days when you're not excited about doing it. Having a Bible study time uh, is, is a discipline. You've got to set a, a slot in your day and say, this is the time that I'm going to study my Bible. You should have a time set aside where you're just going to read your Bible. You should have some time set aside where you're going to memorize Scripture. And you're going to meditate on the Word of God. You should set times aside for these things. And it's not natural to do. That's why it requires discipline. And when I was in the military, I learned uh, uh, a whole new word, and that was discipline. <laughs> uh, I learned a lot of lessons in the military, and the biggest one was discipline. Regulation. Uh, just having a set time and doing a set schedule. I learned that. And it was a... a a blessing and a benefit in my uh, not just Christian life but my just my life altogether having a schedule learning discipline <clears throat> the Christian life is a disciplined life telling my body body this is what the Bible says this is right whether I feel like it or not this is what I'm going to do I am going to obey the Word of God consistently by schedule on purpose not by accident. Nobody accidentally finds themselves praying. Nobody accidentally finds themselves studying the Word of God. The Bible says much study is a weariness of the flesh. The flesh does not want to study. The flesh does not want to pray. The flesh does not want to soul win. The flesh does not want to go to church. The flesh definitely does not want something telling it what to do. <clears throat> the hardest word in the English language for a human being to accept is the smallest word in the English language. And it's the word no. And it's especially hard when it's coming from myself. When I have to say, Kevin, no, we're not going to do that. Kevin, yes, we're going to do this. It is vital that you and I have a set time to pray. If we are going to pray, we have to be willing to set a time aside. It ought to have enough importance to be scheduled down. It takes time to commune with God. I know that we can, uh, the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing, and we're supposed to uh, go through our, out our day practicing the presence of God and walking and talking with Him, but there should be a time scheduled in our day where we just get in our prayer closets, get away from the world, get away from the hustle and bustle of life, and devote our time to seeking God's face and crying out to Him. It takes time to intercede for others. It takes time to pray and, and to do what ought to be done. Time has to be given to prayer. There's no other way around it. It takes time. And you know, when you give time, you're giving a part of your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I think God deserves the best hours of our day. Not the leftover moments at night before you crawl into bed after having operated all day long without getting in touch with heaven, God wants the quality time and quiet time, uninterrupted, where you are not involved in a dozen, dozen different thought patterns and a, uh, a dozen different uh, um, other things going on. God wants your attention as well as your time. He wants your devotion. He wants your focus. He wants you homing in on Him and getting alone with Him in His presence. Most of the time, when we do pray, we pray with our minds being distracted and other things going on about us. We really are not giving God the attention that He deserves and the attention that He ought to have. We are not giving ourselves over to prayer. We also need to give quantity time to prayer. You know, we sing the song, Sweet Hour of Prayer, now, if we sing the truth, we would have to sing fleeting moment of prayer that interrupts my life of care. <clears throat> Having a fervent prayer life is not a reality to most people of God. One of the great reasons is because we do not have the discipline 
of prayer established in our hearts. <clears throat> a preacher came to John Wesley, uh, who started the Methodist Church, and he said, it is rumored that you spend two hours a day in prayer. Is that true? Wesley said, yes, that is true. <clears throat> From four o'clock to six o'clock every morning, I pray. The preacher said, well, I'm just too busy to pray two hours a day. John Wesley said to him, sir, I am not too busy to pray two hours a day. I cannot get done what God has to, what has to get done without the help and intervention of God Almighty. <clears throat> Time must be spent in prayer. <clears throat> I was uh, this summer. Uh, I found a book called uh, "The Private Devotional Lives of Spurgeon, Moody, and Talmage." And as I read that book, I I was under deep conviction. Uh, just looking at the devotional lives of these great men of the faith. And these guys spent 12 and 13 hours reading the Bible, studying the Bible, and just spending time in prayer. That's half a day. They gave to God. And we can see what God did with these men. I mean, good night. He, 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 he used these men in a mighty way uh, to send revivals all across the globe. And I believe it was because of the time, the discipline that they spent seeking God's face. Fervent prayer is not an accident, nor is it an incident. It is a discipline of life. It is something that becomes part of your character. It's something that becomes a good habit. It's something that you ultimately do by reflex and with a hunger for communion with God. It's just it, 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 you do it, uh, I think they say, what, 12 days? You do something, it becomes a habit. And when you make prayer a matter of habit, it's just something that go, you're going to go to, you're going to rely on. You know, make prayer a pattern of your life. And it will become the power of your life. Isn't it amazing how folks talk about not having time to pray? I know I need to, but I just do not have time to pray. Isn't it strange that you have time to eat? You have time to sleep? You have time to fellowship? You have time to make money? You have time to play? You have time to get on your phone? You have time to get on Facebook? You have time to do all these things, but you cannot find time in your busy schedule to commune with the God who breathed this universe into existence. The God who gave you life. The God who's given you all things. If you and I believe what the Bible says, then we ought to think it is important enough to get in touch with God. Is praying as important as eating is? Is it as important as sleeping is? Is it as important as making money? Then if I have time for those things, and I schedule those things, I ought to have a schedule for meeting with God and to pray. When you have a job, you set the alarm clock. If you do not get up, you will not get paid. You say, I do not feel like it this morning, but I must get up. I must go to work. I have a responsibility. I'm going to make myself do what I'm supposed to do. You need to contact, you need contact with God, contact with heaven, more than you need all the money in the world <clears throat> that you could gather. I'm not against making money. I'm not against having a job. But what I'm saying is that you need to schedule a time for God Almighty and put Him first. We rush off to the work of the day, and there are so many things that pull on us. <clears throat> That's why we need God. We need a prayer life. We need to cry out unto Him. We need to schedule a time of prayer. Ian Bounds said, not to give prayer and religion a set and sacred time is to murder it outright. Some of us are guilty of murder. We didn't kill anybody, but we killed our prayer time. Most of us have good intentions, but once you get into the hustle and bustle, it's all over. Too many things demand your time. Too many things demand your attention. They captivate you, and they keep you from giving God what He deserves. The devil fears nothing more than he fears prayer. So he fights nothing more fiercely than he fights for our prayer lives. <clears throat> One preacher said, every problem for a child of God is a prayer problem. The truth is that we experience things that we would, could overcome if we would just schedule prayer. If we had the discipline of a set time to be indefinite about our prayer time or to give it less than our prime time 
is to really not give it respect. It is to slight prayer. It is to say, yes, it is a luxury, but do I do not have a, it's not a necessity. It would be a wonderful thing to do if you and I had time to pray. <clears throat> you know, what's important for, to you, you make time for. There was a, 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 a teacher that was trying to illustrate something to his class, and so he took out the jar from underneath his desk, and he filled it up with rocks. And he asked his class, he said, is there anything else that I can fit in this jar? And the class said, no, you filled it to the top with rocks. And then he reached under his desk and he pulled, pulled out uh, a bunch of pebbles and he put all the pebbles uh, in, into the jar and it filled up all the cracks uh, that the big rocks had left behind. And then he asked his class, he said, is this jar full? And the class looked at each other and he said, well, yeah, now, now the jar is full. And he said, really? He reached under his desk and he pulled out a bag of sand. And he poured sand into the jar of the rocks and the pebbles. And it filled up all the other little cracks. And uh, then he asked his class, now is this jar full? And they looked at each other and they said, okay, yeah, now the jar is full. And he said, really? And he reached under his desk and he pulled out another jar of water. And he poured water into the jar. And he said, now is the jar full? And they said, okay, now the jar is full. And then he said, I have a question for you. What was the purpose of this illustration? <clears throat> and so the, one of the kids raised his hand and he says, the purpose of this illustration is that you could always fit more stuff in the jar. And he said, no, that wasn't the purpose of this illustration. The purpose of this illustration was to show you to put the big rocks in first. Because if I would have filled it up with water and sand, I wouldn't have been able to get the pebbles in. I wouldn't have been able to get the rocks in. And the purpose of this illustration is to illustrate that you can not always can put more things in your life, but you need to put the more important things, the big rocks, in your life first. And one of the big rocks that we need to put in our life is prayer, devotion to God. And that ought to be one of the first things that we do in the day before we wake up, or when we wake up, before we reach for our cell phones, before we look at the alarm clock, the first thing we should do is go to God in prayer. Talk to Him immediately. <clears throat> put that rock in your life. <clears throat> and, 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 and then you can put pebbles in your life. Then you can put sand in your life. Then you can put water in your life. But let's get the big rock, the most important thing, in there first. Anything that is right to do demands that you schedule it. <clears throat> I, was, uh, I was, oh, listening to... Um, Oh, what's his name? The, the, the money guy. Dave Ramsey. Me and, me and my wife like to listen to him sometimes. And uh, he was saying at the, in January, he was talking about a budget. And he was saying that how important it is to make a budget. Because if you don't make a budget, you're just going to let your money tell you what it wants to do. And when you make this budget, you've got to stick to it. You've got to let it command you what to do. Otherwise, you're just going to let your money uh, tell you what to do. And then he said, you know, I know I'm, I don't usually go into off-subject from money to other topics, but I just want to say this, that you need to do the same thing that you do with your money, set a budget, as you do with your time. You need to have a calendar. You need to have a budget. You need to... Budget out your time, have a journal, say this is what I'm doing this day, this is what I'm doing this week, this is what I'm doing this month, and let that schedule tell you what to do. Otherwise, because time is just like money. And if you don't tell your time what to do, it'll dictate to you what to do. And just like our prayer life, if you don't schedule a prayer life, and when I, you, you should have a prayer journal. You should schedule it on, this is the day I'm going to pray for this. This is the day I'm going to pray for that. This is the day I'm going to uh, spend time talking to God about this. Schedule it out. If you don't schedule your prayer life, you're not going to have one. Anything that is right to do demands that you schedule it. You do not wait for time to come around. You just tell the people at your work that when you have time, you will show up. Well, how long will that last to your job? <clears throat> And you let everything grab for your time and attention and keep you from work. See how long you'll have a job if you just work that way. Yeah, I'll go to work uh, uh, whenever I do. <clears throat> and you wouldn't last a day. 
everything would come up, everything would pull for your time. You would never end up going. That's why you've got to schedule in saying, I'm going to work. I'm, the boss tells me I've got to be there at 8 o'clock. I'm going to be there at 7.30. And in order to get there at 7.30, I've got to set my alarm at, at 4, have my devotions, eat my breakfast, if you jog or whatever you do. I've got to fit all this in before I get to work. This is how long it's going to take me to do all that. I've got to schedule it all in. Make a plan. If you don't make a plan, then you've already made a plan to fail. The Bible says that Jesus went out a great while before day. You know, the psalmist says in the book of Psalms, he says, early will I seek thee. Now that could be talking about early in life, or that could be talking about early in the day. I think both's right. In Acts chapter 3, verse number 1, the Bible says that Peter and John went up to the temple at the ninth hour, being the hour of prayer. The hour of prayer. They already have this scheduled. This is the time that we go and we pray. <clears throat> a scheduled time where they got together to pray. <clears throat> David said, evening and morning and at noon will I pray. That was David's schedule. <clears throat> All these people, they had scheduled times, set times, to get in touch with God. Daniel knelt in his room with his window open towards Jerusalem. The Bible says he did that seven times a day. The Bible makes it very clear that when God created Adam and Eve and put them in the Garden of Eden, the Bible says that they walk with God in the cool of the day. That was morning time. Every day there was a scheduled time for walking with God, for communing with God, for talking with God. God set up that schedule with Adam and Eve. Well, if he did that, don't you think he wants a scheduled time for me and you to pray? You know, we have times to eat, we have times to sleep. But no time to pray. Something is wrong with our priority. Something is wrong with our discipline of life. The best hours of the day are always the morning hours. They are the most uninterrupted. If God is not first in our thoughts and efforts in the morning, He will be last place all day long. I mean, didn't He teach us an example in the book of Exodus and Leviticus that we were supposed to give Him the first of everything? We're supposed to give him our firstborn. We're supposed to give him the first of our increase. We're supposed to give. We're supposed to give him the first part of our day. <clears throat> That's what God wants. It's sacred. It's holy. It belongs to God. The two statements that the Bible makes about Jesus: one was in the morning, and the other in our text was in a great while before day. Are are significant statements. God is trying to teach us something. Nothing in the Bible is there by accident. It is there because God has something for us to learn. So often we miss a statement like these, connected to the prayer habit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Morning listedless is a sign of cold, indifferent, listless heart. The heart that is slow to seek after God in the morning is a heart that has lost its relish for the person of God, and it's lost its appetite and its hunger and its thirst for God himself. God is more concerned that you and I fall in love with Him, then that we fall in love with His work. He wants us to do His work, but more important than that, He wants us to love Him first. He wants us to seek Him first. He said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. <clears throat> Listen, the Laodicean church, I believe they have this attitude to, in this day and age, is, okay, Lord, what do you want us to do? Oh, you want us to go out into the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Okay, we got it. We don't need you anymore. Oh, we'll go out and we'll go do what you told us to do without your help. And uh, that's the exact opposite of what God wants us to do. We need His power to do what He's called us to do. We need His power to just be a husband, to be a wife, to be a, uh, a, 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 a citizen, to be a father. Uh, I need His help and I need His power. And the only way I'm going to get that is by seeking His face, by being in His presence. That's the only way I'm going to get His power is through His presence. <clears throat> the disciples came to Jesus and said, All men seek Thee. He said, I know, and I'm going to see them in a minute. But I had to get my prayer time taken care of first. I got out here before they got out of bed so that I could be ready to minister to them when they came. You and I need to give time, a set time, to prayer. Jesus did. Robert Murray uh, was a great man of, of prayer. Uh, he tottered into the grave at a ripe old age of 29. He literally prayed himself to death. Most of us, if we live 
to be 129 will not accomplish in the extra 100 years what he did in his 29 years of fervent prayer. He said this, A wretched system, and unscriptural it is, not to begin the day seeking God. The morning hours from 6 to 8 are the most interrupted and should be thus employed. <clears throat> Francis Asbury, an old circuit riding preacher, had, <clears throat> had, had a sickness so bad that he would have to wrap, it, wrap up his body, take a stick and twist it to ride 50 or 60 miles, in some cases in great pain. He said this about prayer, about his prayer life. I propose to rise at 4 o'clock as often as I can and spend two hours in prayer and meditation. These men probably went to bed about 8 or 9 o'clock. You cannot get to bed at 2 o'clock in the morning and get up at 4. Samuel Rutherford, a great old prayer warrior, said that he rose at 3 o'clock in the morning to meet God in prayer and did not miss a morning watch. Joseph Elin spent from 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock in prayer communion with God. Of the noise created by those who rose earlier than he, he would bemoan himself, and he said, This noise shames me greatly. Does not my master deserve better than theirs? He said, I am getting up at 4 and praying until 8. Somebody gets up at 3. 30 to make money. That grieves me. Martin Luther said that he could do nothing worthwhile if his best three hours had not been spent in prayer. You know, if you if you were to give God 10% of everything and you look at a 24-hour day, then you would have to give him 2.4 hours every day and that would just be his. That would just be the tithe. That would just be 10% of your day. We should go above and beyond that. Just like our money, we should give them our time. Have you ever noticed that the people that we read about in Christian history were people who knew something about prayer, and especially reading about people in the Philadelphian church age? They had a good work ethic, but they also knew something about the discipline of prayer. You read about the lives of men like Abel Clary, who traveled with Charles Finney. Charles Finney was probably one of the greatest revivalists who ever lived since the time of the Apostle Paul. Finney said, on many occasions, my reward most likely will be given to a man by the name of Abel Clary, who would literally pray by the hour and by the day in private. Sometimes that old man would pour out his soul in intercessory prayer for eight to ten hours a day, laboring, and never even show up at the meeting, but the mighty power of God would fall. I remember when I was at um, Gloryland Baptist Church, and they had their first camp meeting that I was involved in. A week before the camp meeting started, they passed out a book on uh, Daniel Nash, the life and history of Daniel Nash. It was just a little pamphlet that they passed out to everybody in the church. And basically in this pamphlet, it told his life story. Daniel Nash, probably if I said his name, most people wouldn't know who he is. But if I say, said the name, um, uh, uh, if I told you about the uh, Great Awakening and, uh, in, in America, you would know about that. Well, Charles, uh, or Daniel Nash, went in every city, in every town, and he would go and ask for a place to stay. He would go in their basement and he would pray, sometimes 12, 14 hours a day. Sometimes he would fast for days and <clears throat> go and pray for revival to fall. Then he would go up and move to the next town. And when he did, the preacher would come in behind him and preach, and revival fell all over America. The Great Awakening happened. He never even got to see it because he was just going before and, and praying down. I mean, I think he... He was in the presence of God uh, when he was praying anyway, so he didn't need to see it. <clears throat> but that's what great men of God did before. Our time. <clears throat> Have you ever... <clears throat> oh, there's a, a guy named David Brainerd, a missionary to the American Indians. There was another man who taught to the grave in a ripe old age of 29. He died in the house of Jonathan Edwards, uh, the man who preached uh, that message, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and who began the great, great Awakening in the Northwest. As David Brainerd was dying, Edward said this, I thank God that in his providence he allowed Brainerd to die in my home, that I might hear his prayers and see his compassion and hear his intercession. It affected my life. John Hyde, uh, better known as Praying Hyde, the apostle of prayer, and the man who never sleeps because of his cons consistent interceding for others, his constant prayer. These men were dedicated to prayer. They knew something about prayer. They knew that power was in prayer, and that, 
and that power was so real in their every action and in their every move uh, because of their consistent, disciplined prayer life. David Brainer said this, I love to be alone at my cottage where I can spend much time in prayer. Most people do not know much, much about spending time in prayer. Most people do not have the discipline of a set time. God is not important enough for them to schedule a time for Him in prayer. Prayer is not measured by moments alone, but to give only a few moments to it is a sign of disrespect. Let me ask you a question. How much time did you spend with God this morning in prayer? What if we collected your report? I remember reading about a guy named John Welsh. He spent seven or eight hours a day in prayer. You say, well, I do not think I could have done that. Do you think maybe you could spend 45 minutes in prayer? Do you think maybe you could spend a half hour in prayer? Do you think maybe he could get enough attention in your life where you thought it was enough to schedule a time to meet him every day? <clears throat> Our laziness after God is the crying sin of this day. I mean, it reflects our Laodicean Christi Christianity across the globe. We're so carnal and worldly in our thinking. Even the cleanliness living people, the most religious people, are so out of touch with the matter of prayer and communion with a holy God. The children of the world pursue their desires early and late and in between, while the people of God neither pursue Him early nor late, and their midday pursuit of God is tame and feeble at best. Ian Bounds, uh, <clears throat> said this, No man gets God in his fullness who does not follow hard after him. And no man follows hard after God who is not after him before the day dawns. Oh, for the discipline of a set time and plenty of it. Early, before the hustle and bustle of the day begins, before the cares of life seek in, before the distractions of life, before all the things that seek our attention sink in, oh, that we would seek God's face. We need the discipline of a sanctified, solitary place. Jesus went out into a solitary place. The fact that some places that he frequented, there were some places where he had prayed before, there were some places that he went to, the Bible talks about the Mount of Olives where often was reported in prayer, <clears throat> there were some places that were sacred to Jesus Christ. There were some meeting places that were set apart by him where he did nothing but get in touch with his heavenly father consistently. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, Judas knew where to find him at the Mount of Olives, or at, at the garden, because that's where he went to pray. He was there every morning before the sun rose up. He went down to a place where there was no distraction. He got away from the work so he could get in touch with his heavenly father. In Matthew chapter number 7, Jesus says this. He gave us some instructions in prayer. He said, when you pray... Enter into your closet. You know, we're, we're living in a time now where everybody has to be quarantined. The idea of that verse there is that God wants to be quarantined with you. He wants you just like we're all shut up in our houses with our doors shut. He says, go into your prayer closet and shut the door. Get along with God. He is talking about a private place. He's talking about a scheduled place. He's talking about a place of no distractions. In Acts chapter number 10, the Bible says that Peter went into a housetop to pray. Everybody else was down there fellowshipping. Everybody else was down there feasting. But Peter went up and confined himself to pray. He got alone and prayed with God. Your prayer place ought to be a sanctified place. A place that is sacred to you. It ought to have some atmosphere to it. The first time you pray someplace... <clears throat> There it is nothing sacred about it. But after you have prevailed in prayer, after you've sought God's face there time and time and time after again, but once the mighty power of God falls, once the answer comes, there will be something about that place. Uh, man, I remember taking my wife uh, up to the Lord Land Baptist Church up in Alabama, uh, <laughs> where my life had changed, and showing her the spot at the altar, and said, man, this is the place. God forgave me. This is the place where God gave me a sacred second chance. This is the place where God wiped the slate clean right here. Gave me something to do. He said, put me in His work right here. Man, there's just something about that place. I'm talking about a place that is given to the work of a prayer and prayer only. 
I'm talking about a place that makes us think of God and past wrestlings, times that we have prevailed. I'm talking about a place that refreshes our memory, a place that warms our affections, a place that quickens our faith. And when we go into that place, the atmosphere is already set because we prevailed in prayer there. Real prayer has not only to do with the act of crying out to God, but it has something to do with the atmosphere that we pray in. If you are distracted by other things, you are not going to have the, to have the atmosphere that makes prayer what it ought to be. Yeah, you can pray in a nightclub, but there's something about going in your prayer closet and getting alone with God and getting in touch with Him. There's a different atmosphere there. You can pray while the television's going, while people are, are asking you questions and, and, and your kids are jumping on your lap. And yeah, you can pray. You can pray while you're driving down the road. There's something about getting into an atmosphere of prayer, a place that you've already set aside to pray, and you go and you get alone with God. <clears throat> you know, Bethel may have just been a place where an ordinary, uh, just an ordinary place to everybody else, but it was not just another place to Jacob. He had prevailed there. He, he had become a prince with God and a man there. We need to have a place like that in our life, a place where we've prevailed in prayer. That holy mount was special uh, to Moses. He had met God there numerous times. He had consistently gotten in touch with God there. And he had seen the Shekinah glory of God there. Jesus has his Mount of Olives. Daniel had his chamber where he faced Jerusalem, where he prayed seven times a day. John Wesley had his little closet where he consistently prayed that he did <clears throat> that he literally wore groves in, grooves in the floor where his knees had been. David Brainerd had a scheduled a uh, cottage where he went to pray. William Brand Brandwell, a mighty man of prayer, had a, his favorite forest in the, in the, in that he would go and meet with God. John Fletcher, the old Methodist, had a little room where he spent so much time that he literally stained the walls of the room with the breath of his prayers. Charles Finley had a place in the woods where shortly after his conversion, he entered and came out of that place the same day filled with the Holy Ghost of God. And in his later years, he went there frequently to commune with God. There were places in these great men of God's lives that God met them, and it became a sacred place. And they would frequently visit there to get into the presence of God. Samuel Rutherford could say of a wooded, consecrated spot where he prayed, There wrestled I with the angel of the Lord and prevailed. <clears throat> you read about the life of Ford Potter, a modern-day prayer warrior. He went to heaven, uh, oh, probably about 10 years ago, and he had a little attic area where he daily prayed for hours. To fail to give prayer a set time in a sanctified place is to despise the very act of prayer. It is to lightly esteem it. It is disrespecting uh, the presence of God. Stop and think about this. What is the kitchen for? Oh, well, that's the eating place. What is the bedroom for? Oh, that's the sleeping place. Do you have a shower or the bathroom or do you bathe outside? Is it a strange thing how you have a special place where you eat, a special place where you sleep, a special place where you bathe? You not only have a set time, you have a set-aside room for it. There is a place set up to do one thing. That room is sanctified to do that purpose. Is it amazing that we do not have a special place to get in touch with God in prayer? Doesn't it tell you anything at all? At Glory Land, they had a room that was dedicated just for the men to go and pray. They had another room uh, for the women just to go and pray. It was for nothing else. And before church started, the men would go pray in this room. The women would go pray in this church room. Uh, my city church, Tri-City Baptist Church, uh, Pastor Shepherd decided to have a room set aside and, and he set it up where you can meditate in there. Uh, I, I, I put the book uh, uh, Prayer by John Bunyan, or Paul Bunyan in there, and, uh, and it was just a room for prayer. And he gave everybody uh, uh, the combination so you can get in there anytime you want during the week and just go and pray and get along and pray for God. And he told me, he said, man, <laughs> it was such a great idea doing this. He says, but now anytime I walk in that room, it's just a different atmosphere. It's just something sacred about that room. We need to have a place set aside to pray. No wonder Paul said to Titus about some of those people that their God is their belly 
because all they thought about were the carnal things. Those things were important. They had set times. They had set places for everything temporary and no time, no place set for the things that are eternal. The habitual place of prayer, that place where you come again and again and again, will kindle a livelier faith and a stronger passion for God. It will elevate your feelings and fix your concentration on the things of God. There's something about that atmosphere that's created by frequently praying in the same place. When I come into the kitchen and sit down, I'm ready to eat. There's something about the atmosphere, and not just the, the time. When I go to a restaurant and I sit down, I do not want to wait there three hours to eat. I'm ready. When I go to bed, I do not toss and turn. I'm ready to sleep because I'm in the place where sleep happens. I have a time and a place for everything I do. If Christianity is ever going to have a great effect on you and those around you, it has to be important enough in your life that you have time and a place set aside for prayer. We need the discipline of a steady habit. The disciples knew where to find Jesus. That is because they found him there before. <clears throat> he had shown them those places before. There are places of prayer. They knew what to expect of him because not only had he good habits, he had godly habits. Uh, when I was when I was in Bible college, uh, I uh, I used my summers to uh, get some hands-on training. And so one summer, I worked at a bunch of different Christian uh, uh, camps and uh, teen camps and uh, junior camps and Spanish camps and stuff. And one summer, I traveled with an evangelist. And man, we went all across the United States. We we're in Delaware. We we're in Tennessee. We we're in Florida. We we're in all different churches. And, we were visiting this one pastor in Florida. He was on, on the coast right where it turns into the panhandle. And uh, he said, that one of the first things he wanted to show us, he took us to the beach, a little secluded beach where no people were or anything. He says, man, this is the spot. I can drive my Jeep up here on this beach, and I get up here about 5 o'clock in the morning, and this is where I get along with God. And this place is so special to me because God had did a work in my heart here. He did so many things. He, he brought me over to this area. He told us his whole life history of how he had a church in Central Florida that didn't work out. Uh, it was very grievous, the people in there. And, and uh, God led him to this place to pray, and people asked him over in this place uh, to come start a church, and he started this church. And God moved in his life in that place. We're just looking around, and we're seeing a beach. Nothing special about it, but to him, there was an atmosphere here that God had met with him. And it was a special place. And this was his place that he went to and prayed. And Luke chapter number 22, verse 39, the Bible says, And he came out and went as he wanted. The word want means that he had a habit of doing it, as he did before, as he did frequently. It was a reflex, a habitual action that he had done over and over again. The text tells us, of, <coughs> deals with prayer. And he came out as as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed. God gives us the discipline of a steady habit in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not hit and miss, on and off, up and down. He was not sometimes there and sometimes not. He had a steady habit of doing the things that he ought to do. That is how Judas knew where to find him on the night that he betrayed him. It was at the Mount Olives where he had always uh, came at night to pray. We're going to go ahead and end there, pick it back up tomorrow. <clears throat> but I encourage you, have a set place every day that you retreat and you go to and you shut the door and you go into your closet and you pray and you get alone with God. I encourage you to have a schedule. Go there at a certain time every day. This is where I'm going to go. Keep a journal. Keep a prayer journal. And, and I promise you this will enhance your prayer life. And it will, it will get you into the presence of God. And you will see the power of God in your life. Let's go to the Lord prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this uh, uh, time that you've given us, Lord, to learn about prayer. And Lord, to look at your life and see how you practice prayer. Lord, you rose up early in the morning. You set aside a time. That evening, they knew where to find you because you were there praying in a certain place, Lord. And you were showing us the discipline that it takes to live 
a Christ-powered life, a Holy Ghost-empowered life. Lord, we need your power. And the only way we're going to get your power is to get in your presence. The only way we're going to get in your presence is through prayer. And setting us time aside and disciplining ourselves to pray, Lord, is the only way that you're going to use us. Lord, I think of, uh, of all of the preachers in my life, that you, all the people in my life that you brought in my life, that I looked up to, Lord, they all have a prayer life. I think of Pastor Charlie. He used to tell stories about when he was in Bible college and him and a couple of his preacher friends would go out, lay prostrate in the bushes and just beg for your power, beg for your presence, and beg for you to use it, Lord. My, how you've done it. Lord, I need your power. And I, I pray for your power on every single student that's watching this. And Lord, we, we just ask that through this class, Lord, that, Lord, that we would be drawn closer to you and we'd have a greater prayer life. Lord, we ask all this for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll pick it back up here again tomorrow. Thank you. Fifty minutes. It's good.